Grace is what God gives you that you don't deserve, all right? The definition that we've always said is grace is getting something that I don't deserve. That's what grace is, that at the end of life, it's a rewarding grace that rewards us with heaven. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 50 years or if you've been a Christian for five minutes, that grace still applies to you. You don't get a bigger mansion in heaven because you've done better things. You, when you go to heaven, God rewards you and that grace is available to you. That is the grace that's rewarding grace. That's the grace that you can hang on to this morning. I I don't care how bad you've been in your past. I don't care what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to what happens. The grace of God, your sin is not bigger than the grace of God. God's grace is always bigger than your sin. In any kind of gathering today in America, if someone, I've seen this happen at graduations, if someone stands up and they begin to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. If I said, um, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Okay, we don't have to go through all that, but you get it. There are certain phrases and certain things that when we hear them, our, our culture knows them and has heard them enough that we've memorized those things. In the same way, if I was to say, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Even a heathen knows that song. Everybody knows that because it's become such a part of our culture. It's become, I I know we, we, we say that we live in a Christian culture I think more and more we live in a post-Christian culture here in America. But because of growing up in a Christian culture that America was founded on Christian principles, there is still morals, there are still character things, no matter how much in government and in politics they want to fight that, there are still morals and characters that we have that are entrenched within our society. Now, they can legislate those out. They can try everything they can to move those out. But inside of us is still these words that we hold inside of our hearts. And this one song that just Sandy sang just a few minutes ago is one of those songs. We're starting a new series that I'm calling Songs. And we're just going to take a song per week, and we're going to talk about the backstory of that song, where that song came from, what that song means. And this morning, we're going to use this song called Amazing Grace. Let me, let me read to you a little bit of the words. There are actually seven stanzas to Amazing Grace. And let me, let me read these to you, and you will recognize them. Maybe some of you won't, but we traditionally have about three or four that we traditionally sing. But, but let me read them to you. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as time endures. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. And then the seventh stanza, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise 
than when we first begun. Now, probably many of those words you recognize and you've sung those and maybe some of them you're not familiar with because traditionally we've taken about four of those verses and we've sung those traditionally in the church. Maybe when you grew up in church, there was a hymn book that you had and you opened it up and it would usually have four stanzas and there are some of these that wouldn't be in there because we traditionally have just sang those. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the man who wrote this hymn. His name was John Newton. He was born in 1725 and died in 1807, so it is an old, old song. He died at age 82. John Newton was an Englishman, but he was the captain of a ship. He'd grown up on the seas all of his life. All he knew was trading and shipping, and that, that's all his life consisted of. The main portion of his life he spent as a tradesman, but what he traded was he owned and he traded slaves. He was a slave trader. He ran a ship that transported slaves between Sierra Leone and the West Indies back in the late 1700s. And one time when he was on this ship, there was a great there was a great storm that happened. He was on the ship called Greyhound, and a great storm arose off the coast of Ireland. And it was so massive and it was so fearful to him that he hung on to, the, to, to the, the, the mast of that ship, and he made a promise to God. And he said, God, if you will get me out of here. How many of you know what's coming, right? God, if you will get me out of here, I'll serve you all my days. I don't know if you've ever made that commitment to him or ever said that to him in a time of distress. But that's what John Newton did. He said, if you'll get me out of this, I'll turn my life to you and I'll serve you. And God spared him from that. He was able to save the ship and he was able to save himself. And you know what he did? He made right on that commitment and he decided, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to turn everything around and I'm going to start focusing on God. And he did. He changed his whole life around. He quit slave trading. He quit his ships. He sold all of his ships. And he trained to go into the ministry. He was in his late 20s. He trained to go into the ministry and actually became a pastor of a church. And one of the things he would do is that each week at that church, he would write a song. He would write a hymn that reflected what his sermon was for that week. Some of those hymns made it famous. Some of them didn't. But for a service that was on January 1st, uh, January 1st, 1773, 250 years ago, he penned the words to this song, Amazing Grace, because he was preaching that morning on that song. And he wrote that song on, for that morning and previewed it in the church. And now that song has taken on and become part of our Christianity and part of our lives. Get this, a man who used to be a slave trader who didn't serve God, who had a lot in his life to be ashamed of, but God came in and changed his life and he wrote this song, It's an Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a slave trader like me, that saved a wretch like me, that saved an alcoholic like me, that saved a drug addict like me, that saved a, a robber, who, who saved a person like me. You can feel yourself in that if you want to. But that grace is still available to us today. The same grace that saved John Newton is the same grace that we have available to us today. And it's that grace that will change our lives. The last verse of the song, it's interesting. Because the last verse of the song says, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Here's the amazing thing is that John Newton never wrote that verse. He didn't write it. In his original manuscript for a hundred years or so, it was always you. It, it was never in the, the song that they sang. And in 1852, Harry, in Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was a huge influence in, in abolishing slave trade, this verse showed up at the end of that song. We're not completely sure who wrote it, possibly Harriet Beecher Stowe, 
added it to that song because instead of a song that said the earth shall dissolve, instead of an ending saying the earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, it was kind of a downer. And I guess they wanted it to, to have a bit of a more uplifting ending. And so that verse was written at the end of that song and we know that today as part of that song is the ending verse. Isn't that interesting? A few years later, and I didn't write this down, but a few years later, Chris Tomlin was asked to use that song in a, um, a concert or something that he had done. And part of a, I can't remember exactly what it was, a production that they were asking him to be a part of. And they asked him if he would consider writing a verse to that song that would be a little easier to sing. And he resisted it because how do you change a hymn, right? How do you change, you know, the, I mean, it's like changing the Lord's Prayer. How do you do that? But when he found out that, that the song had actually been added to already, an author had already added to it, he began to, as he was worshiping, these words came to him uh, of, my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. Is that what it says? And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. And we sing that today and our kids, they don't know that it's any different because they've heard that so much. And what a powerful verse to that song. But the key thing, the star of this song, the, the, the main focus of this song obviously is Jesus. But what about Jesus? It's this word amazing grace. It's this word grace. And so this morning I want to talk a little bit about this word grace. And I want to try to explain it to you in, in just a few minutes. Let me give you a couple of things. And my question this morning is, is why is grace so amazing? Well, let me just give you a few things to tell you why grace is so amazing in, in our lives. Grace is amazing, number one, because grace is undeserved. Grace is undeserved. You can't deserve it. I don't care where you come from. I don't care who your mom and dad are. I don't care how royal your life is. I don't care how poor you've been how successful you've been. I don't care if you grew up in church or you didn't grow up in church. Grace doesn't care because grace doesn't come to you because you deserve it. The grace that we're talking about is undeserved. I want you to, there's a, a parable here in Matthew, the 18th chapter, and it's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And let me just give you a little bit of a, 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 a summary of what this, what this parable is. Jesus is telling this parable and he says basically that there was a man who, who wanted to, to um, there, there, was, there was a man who had a large debt. And th this man, he, he had a large debt would, would, which would be the equivalent of, of millions of dollars. And the master, the, the, his, his boss found him and brought him in and said, listen, you owe me this money. And he says, because you owe me this money, I'm going to put you in jail and I'm going to sell your wife and your kids to try to get the money back because you have not paid me back. And this man pleaded with him, oh, sir, please don't. Please have mercy on me. Please spare me this. I will pay it back to you. If you'll just give me a chance, I will pay it back to you. I'll take care of it. And the, and the master believed him. And the master said, okay, I will forgive you of this debt. He didn't ask him to pay it back. He said, I'll forgive you of this debt. And he was so overjoyed that he left that man, he left his master, and while he was on his way home, he found someone that owed him just about $10. And he grabbed that man and said, you owe me money, and you're going to pay me back. And the guy says, I don't have it. He goes, great, I'm going to throw you in jail, and I'm going to put you in jail until you can pay me back the money. So he had him arrested and put in jail. He didn't show him the same mercy and grace that the master had given to him. And so some of the people heard about it and they went back to his master. And they talked to him and they told him what had happened. And the master came back to him. In, in verse number, uh, let me see, where am I going to start? Matthew, let me jump back to Matthew 18. I'm in the wrong one. Matthew 18. And here's what it says in verse number 32. And when the master called his servant in, he said, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I did on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owned. 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So what he's saying here is that this man was forgiven so much. He had been canceled, that that debt had been canceled back. And how could someone in their right mind then leave, have being, being canceled all that millions of dollars, then go out and find someone who just had a little bit of money and demand that money from him. How could someone in their right mind do that? You know what I think it is? I think that the man did not completely believe that he had been forgiven, that the debt had already been canceled completely for him. And now as he leaves, he's scurrying, trying to find that out. Listen, When you finally receive grace from God and when you understand that grace and receive that grace to you and understand that I don't deserve this. I haven't done anything to deserve this. I'm completely undeserving of what God has given me. When you understand that grace, you are willing to give that grace to other people. Listen, here's the thing. I don't find grace. Grace finds me. I don't get grace because I deserve it. But I get grace because grace is available and God gives me that grace. There's a a word that's called provenient grace and we talk about it in theological discussions. It came from Augustine and it's just a grace that was provided to you before you ever knew what grace was. It was a grace that was provided you even before you could accept it. Let me give you this illustration. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham took Isaac and he went up to a mountain. God told him to sacrifice his son on an altar. And he went up and he put his son on the altar and he grabbed the knife and he was getting ready to to kill his son to obey what the Lord asked him to do. And God stopped him and came in a voice and stopped him. And in the process of that, he looked behind him and there was a ram in the thicket. Most of you guys have heard this story. How does provenient grace come in? Provenient grace is grace that was provided for me before I ever knew that there was grace, before I ever needed grace. There was grace that got me to that point. Provenient grace is that God had a plan that as Abraham was walking up that hill with his son, God was already preparing a way for a ram to be caught into a thicket behind him so that when it came time for him to need God, that grace was already provided for him. You God, you guys... God provides grace in our lives before we even knew that we needed grace. He knows where you're coming from. He knows where you've been. And God is working things out, setting things up, providing grace for your forgiveness of sin, grace so that you can be free. He's doing that in already getting ready for you to make the mistakes that you've made. That's the prevenient grace of God. And this morning, that's the grace that we rely on. And that's the grace that brings us salvation. Number two is grace is unmerited. Now, this is a typical thing that we hear when we talk about grace. It just basically means that you don't earn it. You can't earn it. I can't be good enough to get the grace of God. I can't be smart enough to give the grace of God. I can't give enough to the church to be forgiven of my sins. This grace comes to me free of charge. And no matter what I do, I can't be good enough to deserve it. I have the grace of God because he brings it upon me. Grace is what God gives you that you don't deserve, all right? Grace is we, the definition that we've always said is grace is getting something that I don't deserve, all right? That's what grace is as opposed to mercy. Mercy is avoiding something that I do deserve. So in other words, I love to do this. Grace is saying, Wow, God, your grace, I don't deserve this. I I didn't see this coming. Wow, this is unbelievable. Mercy is saying, I avoided something that I should have gotten. I avoided a a train wreck. I I avoided punishment. I, I did this sin, but I'm not held accountable for it because of the grace of God. So when we look at that, we understand that mercy is getting out of something that we do deserve, but grace is being blessed with something that I never knew I would have and I would never deserve. That's the difference. You can't earn it. It is unmerited favor. We work on a merit system. If I do something, I want to be rewarded for it. But what we do if we're not careful is we think that we can be good enough to be a Christian 
Or before I can be a Christian, I've got to be good enough. God, you don't know all the things I've done in my life. He knows everything you've done, and he still loves you. Now, does that absolve us from the fact that we need to live a life that's, that's honoring God? Absolutely not. Once we become a Christian, then because of that, we live a life that's good for God, and then we live a life that's pleasing to him. But God blesses us with that grace. It's unmerited favor. Number three, it's indiscriminate. It's indiscriminate. God does not play favorites. God doesn't play favorites. I want to give you another parable, and this is over in chapter 20 of Matthew, the eight, Matthew 18. Everybody okay? Okay, Matthew 18. Look here at verse number 20, or chapter 20. Let me do it again. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. And there's the parable here that's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. This parable, Jesus talks about it, the kingdom of God is like. And he talks about a man who needed people to work in his vineyard. So he went out and he found men who were ready to work early in the morning. And he says, listen, I will pay you one denarii is what he said. One, it's, a, it's just an amount. I'll pay you this one amount if you'll come and work for me the whole day. And they said, great, we'll come. So he picked him up and he took him to his vineyard, but he still needed more. So he went out at, at, at 9 o'clock in the morning and went out at noon and found more guys. And he says, I, if you will come work for me, I'll pay you what's fair. And they said, we will. So he went and put them in the vineyards. He still needed more workers. And so he went out all the way up until the, the fifth hour of, of the work, or the 5 o'clock in the afternoon. There was only one hour left to work. And he still picked people up and said, if you'll come work for me, I'll pay you. And they said, we will. And so he went and paid them and they worked. They just worked for an hour. The other ones had worked all day. And when they came in, he said to his servants, listen, I want you to get the men together and I want you to pay them what is, is reasonable to pay, pay them what we agreed on. And he says, I want you to start with the ones who came the soonest and go to the ones who st stayed the latest. And I think it's an interesting concept here. And so what he does, he brings the one who just was there an hour and he gives him one denarii. He brings the one who was there for five hours, gives him one denarii. And then the ones who were at the very end who had been working there the whole day, they watched this whole thing. Now they came and they said, here's your money. We give him, he said, whoa, 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 hang on. How is that fair? You, you paid these guys the same amount and they worked not even as much as I did. That's not fair. And the master said, listen, did, didn't, didn't you agree to work for one denarii? Yes, you did. So I'm paying you that amount that you worked for. They weren't happy about that. Look, let's look here at verse number 11. Let's look at verse number 11. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour. They said, and you have made them equal to us who have, been here, who have uh, borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for one denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I give you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so then he ends it with, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Well, many of us are saying, well, hey, that's not fair. That's not fair because these guys worked harder to get it than this guy worked. How do you explain the guy on the cross next to Jesus when he came to Jesus and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. We can't earn this. It's indiscriminate. Or the grace that God gives us comes to the person who comes to Christ five minutes before they die. It's also given to the one who has been born in Christianity and makes that decision early on. It's the same grace. It's not based on your worth. It's not based on your wealth. It's not based on where you come from, your income, how good you are, how bad you are. That grace is available to everyone. And some of you ought to say, praise the Lord, because some of you got some things in your past that you're not very ashamed, or not, not, that you're pretty ashamed of. It's harder for those of us who have lived this life all of our life and we feel like that somehow we've earned this grace. But this grace that God has, it's for everyone equally. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. You may have been a slave trader. You may have been a horrible person. You may have done things that are unspeakable. But I want you to know that the grace of God that this man is talking about and the Bible teaches about is the same grace that's available to every person. 
It doesn't matter where you came from, what you've done. Amen? Let me talk just briefly in this last part about three things. I, I, I put on the notes here, I want to talk about the difference between saving grace and sustaining grace, but I'm going to add one more in there. It was a, it was a game time decision, all right? So let's look at it here. There's three things I want to just emphasize here as we're talking about grace. We've talked a lot about saving grace. That's the grace that God gives us to, to, to save us. It's the grace that Christ died on the cross to give us. Ephesians 2.8, here Paul says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Well, that's what he's talking about. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't pay for it. This grace is a free gift to you, and it's a free gift to everyone. It's available to everyone. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care what you've done in your past. I'll tell you people who have done worse and are still living as Christians today. I'll tell you people who have done worse and who died in salvation, and they're probably going to be in heaven whenever we get there. God's grace is forgiving. And that goes back to this verse, the very first verse. It says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's the saving grace of God. It's his grace that can save you. There's no way for you to be saved except the grace of God. But there has to be in our lives, there has to be this acceptance and, and openness to what God has for us. You know people who the grace is available to, but they've snubbed their nose at it and decided they're going to do their own thing. I would rather live as a heathen and have fun than I would as a Christian and have no fun. And everything's based on fun, who we are, what we see, what social media tells us, what the influencers are like. That's who I focus my time on. If you spend more time, I'm going to get on some toes this morning, if you spend more time on social media than you do spending time reading the Bible or praying or spending time with God, then maybe you need to check what your influences are in your life. Y'all, I got to raise my hand on that one because I'm addicted to reels. I just sit there and I just sit there. Lisa would say, I can sit there and I have no idea what I'm going. And secretly I'm inside, I'm thinking, can someone please rescue me because I can't stop doing my thumb like this and just looking at reels of things I don't really care about. But my focus cannot just be on who's influencing me. My focus has to be on God that's influencing me. That saving grace that he provides to us. Are you guys with me this morning? I hope that this is connecting with you. The next one is a sustaining grace. It's sustaining grace. There's probably a theological word for this. I'm not sure what it is. But it's a sustaining grace. We talked about it just a second ago in Genesis, the 22nd chapter. In this portion of scripture that talks about Abraham and Isaac and the ram and the thicket. And we see it reflected here in the song that says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It's grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. This is a grace that keeps us on track. This is a grace that protects us. This is a grace that helps us through the things of life. Listen, this is a grace that we don't even know that we need, but we have it. When, I was, when Lisa and I were young and we were starting our family, I can remember being, being at church, and I was on staff at the church, and I don't even remember if we had kids, but we had Sunday school back in those days. If you guys can remember those, and we had a Bible study before church, and then we had church, and we had Sunday school. And I was in a Sunday school class because Lisa wanted me to be in this class. It was a young marriage class, and I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be getting ready for service and doing my other things and hanging out with teenagers and all that, but Lisa said, no, this is important to me. And I went to that class bored to death, just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. But in the midst of that, we learn things that now we apply to our marriage and to our family that I didn't even know at the time I needed. In fact, at that time, as a young 20-something-year-old youth pastor, I thought I knew everything. Not that our youth pastor is like that. He's a great guy. But it's that age group. I thought I knew everything. I had, I had written a chapter in a book on parenting. I didn't even have kids. I was an expert. I knew it all. I knew how you should raise your kids. I knew how everybody should raise their kids. 
But the fact is, is that I didn't even know that I needed the information that I was getting until I got into the heat of the battle and had kids. We had four kids at once almost. I mean, within just a few years. But in those times, it was what I learned in those classes that helped sustain me through that process. I didn't even know I needed it until I needed it. That's grace that sustains you. God will bring grace into your life. He'll put you into situations. He'll let you read a book. He'll put you around people that you're noticing the way that they run their kids, the way that they treat their kids, the way that they treat their wife. And it's God's grace that's given you the ability to absorb that. That's the grace that sustains us. Are you with me this morning? Last one, it's rewarding grace. I I may have made this up. I don't know, but it makes sense. There's probably a theological phrase for it, and I don't know, maybe I need to write about it. But listen to this. It's what we call rewarding grace. I want you to turn real quickly to, to, to 2 Timothy in the fourth chapter in the sixth verse. Here's Paul's life. You guys know Paul? Remember Paul? He was the one that his original name was Saul. Remember what Saul did? He was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. He he persecuted Christians. Do you know what that means? That he found where Christians were because Christians were a threat to Judaism. He would find Christians and he would have them stoned. You remember Stephen? Stephen? It was a man that he found and he put him on trial and got people to lie about him and say things that weren't true so that the government, the tribunal, the religious establishment would convict him to be stoned and they took him outside the city and they stoned him. And you know what they did? The men who had the stones, they took off their cloaks and their robes and they handed them to Saul and he held them while these men stoned Stephen and killed him. And then God had plans for for Saul, changed his name to Paul, and you guys know he's one of the most prolific writers that we have in the New Testament. But now Paul's at the end of his life. He's been imprisoned. He's been beat up himself. He's been shipwrecked. He's been snake bit. He's gone through all this stuff in his life. He's gone through all these persecutions, maybe spent more time in jail than he did out of jail. This man went through all kinds of stuff in his life, and now he's kind of at the end of life, and he's finally saying goodbye to his protege, Timothy. And he says this, we're starting in verse number six. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for me to depart. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. That's that hunger that, Sandy was talking about. What is this? This is talking about grace. This is talking about the grace that's provided for us. That at the end of life, it's a rewarding grace that rewards us with heaven. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 50 years or if you've been a Christian for five minutes, that grace still applies to you. You don't get a bigger mansion in heaven because you've done better things. You, when you go to heaven, God rewards you and that grace is available to you. That is the grace that's rewarding grace. And here in this song, this very last verse that wasn't even written by John Newton, it says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. That's the grace I'm talking about. That's the grace that's available to you. That's the grace that you can hang on to this morning. I, I don't care how bad you've been in your past. I don't care what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to what happens. The grace of God, your sin is not bigger than the grace of God. God's grace is always bigger than your sin. And God will always bring forgiveness and wholeness and healing to your body. Amen. So listen, you guys, this morning, as we end this service and we spend this time in prayer right here at the end, I want you to know, I don't care what's happening in your life. You can't say, Pastor, okay, this is all great, but you don't know me. it, It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. God knows you. And let me tell you something else. God brought you here this morning so you could hear this message. Some of you almost slept in and looked at your watch or your clock and said, I, I'm just gonna, I had a hard day yesterday. 
We were doing a lot of stuff. I was up late last night. I'm just going to sleep in today. I don't, don't, you don't need to raise hands. I, know, I, I can tell who you are. I see you sleeping out there. Someone invited you this morning. You maybe just walked in. But I want you to know something. You're here because God put it together. That was provenient grace. He was bringing you to this point. It's the ram that was coming up the other side of the mountain and having an encounter with a thicket while you were at this side waiting for the right amount of time that you could look over and see the grace of God. Now the grace of God is provided for you. This is your morning. Let's lean into the grace of God. Lord Jesus, Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the grace that becomes an integral part of our society that comes a part of our culture. But Lord, that grace can hang out there and it can be in the air and we never receive it. But Lord, we have to receive it. We have to step into it. We have to allow you, Lord Jesus. We have to, well, we have to allow ourselves to open up to your grace. It's provided for us. It's a benefit that we have. But Lord, we must accept it. So Lord Jesus, this morning, we accept your grace. We lean into your grace. We ask, Lord Jesus, for those who are here that maybe they say, Pastor, I need to know that grace. I need to have that assurance in my life that that grace is, is applied to me and I want to open up my heart to receive that grace this morning because I don't know if, if I've ever done that. I'm not demeaning what grace is, but I want you to know something. Grace finds you but your job is to open up and say, I accept it. I, I want it to come in. I want God's love and his forgiveness to indwell my life. It's the only way that you get to heaven. You can't get to heaven by being good. That's what we talked about. You can't get to heaven by being rich. You can't get to heaven by having good parents. The only way you get to heaven is that the grace of God is available to you and you open up your life to that grace. And when you do, the moment you do, then heaven is yours. So I want to ask you this morning, friends, have you accepted that grace? Have you opened up your life to that grace? If not, you came to the right place this morning because this morning you're going to be born again you're going to be forgiven. That grace is here. It's available. It's yours. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. That's ending this morning. But now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see. I want to ask you to stand with me, would you please? Lord Jesus, I ask this morning as we close this service, as we have heard this message and we looked in your word and now we're reflecting on our own lives and it's come to a point where we have to make the decision, am I going to accept the grace of God, the, the saving grace of God, the sustaining grace of God? Or am I going to continue to, to resist it and run away from it? Lord, I pray this morning that those who have come would say, yes, I want that grace of God and I'm opening my life up to it. And this morning, salvation can be theirs. Folks, I want to ask you this question and here's what we're going to do. I, I want to give you that opportunity to, just as a pastor, as a, as a, a, a professional minister, I want to walk you through this process. Maybe you don't have the confidence to do it or maybe you don't know how to do it. But this morning, I'm going to walk you through this process. And I want to make it easy. I don't want to put you on the spot. We're not going to bring you in the front and put a microphone and ask you to confess your sins. But what I am going to ask you to do in just a few minutes is just to raise your hand so I can see where you're at. And it's also your, your confession to say, I need that grace. I need that grace. There's some stuff in my life I need that grace to cover. I need that grace for forgiveness. I need that grace to sustain me. Maybe you've been a Christian and you've lived, been in and out of church or whatever the case might be, but there's not that 
hunger that Sandy was talking about. It's been gnawing at you. It's not just I'm serving God to get something, but I want to know that I know. I want to have that peace that I see in other people's lives. I want to have that trust in Christ that I see other people have. I want to have that calmness in times of pressure. I want to know this morning that if something were to happen to me that I would spend the rest of my life in heaven with my family, with my friends, with those who I know who have served you. I don't want to take a chance on not making heaven. So what I'm going to ask, if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand in just a few minutes. I'm going to ask you to do that. Then you can put your hand back down and then we're just going to pray. I'm not going to have you come forward. We're just going to pray for you right where you're at. You're raising your hand as your confession that you need a Savior, that you need that grace. And God sees that. So what I'm going to ask right now, if that's you, if you say, I need that grace, I need that forgiveness in my life, I want to ask you just to raise your hand so I can see where you're at. Yep, 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 yep. I see you guys. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, put your hands back up. Lord Jesus, I'm just pausing right now because I want to take all this in. I want there's refreshing in your presence. Lord, I sense your presence in here right now. I sense your presence in here. Lord, this morning we are sinners that are saved by grace. Father, we are people who are in the need of the grace of God to come in and refresh us. To completely come in and take our sins away because our sins have already been paid for by Jesus on the cross. I want to connect with that. This morning, Lord Jesus, your grace brought us here. Your grace sustains us. Your grace speaks to us. Lord, I'm speaking right now of a salvation grace. I pray, Lord, for those people who have raised their hands this morning. Lord, as they raise their hands, they're saying, I want that grace in my life. I need to know that I'm I'm forgiven. And Lord Jesus, as we pray this prayer together, we know that we're forgiven. But Lord, just like the man who left his boss and didn't feel like that he had been forgiven and he went out and and began to not practice grace on other people. Let us understand that once we've been forgiven, it's forgotten and it's gone. And Lord, now it's up to us to receive that grace into our life and let it transform us. Let it change where we go and what we've done. Father, I pray for that grace this morning, Lord. I pray that you would pour it into us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bring forgiveness. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bring wholeness. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this hunger to know you more and serve you more, not the parent, not our parents' religion, not our grandparents' religion, but Lord, something that's fresh, that's just for us. And I pray that you would do that in each heart, in each life. In Jesus' name, we pray it. I wanted everybody to pray this prayer after me. Just repeat it as I say it. Lord Jesus, I need your grace. Forgive me of my past. I know you died on a cross for me. And I know that you are Lord. So I receive your grace into my life. I pray that it changes me. And I will serve you all my life. Thank you for your grace. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's it. Life change just happened. Come on, let's give these people a hand who raised their hands this morning. Thank you, Lord. 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 You guys, I want you to know this grace applies to you. Don't push it away. Receive it. You're going to start noticing it everywhere. And when you start singing this song, the next time you're going to sing it, tears are going to come to your eyes because you understand that's the grace that saves you. 
I appreciate you guys being here this morning. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We will see you back here next Sunday, next Wednesday, whichever. But I hope you guys have a wonderful day. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here this morning.